I finally introduced enough different Octave tools so that we can start writing some pretty complicated programs. Dividing a larger program into different parts makes development and use of the program much simpler. These subtasks in a program are usually implemented as functions. These user-defined functions work the same way as Octave's built-in functions like sine, cosine, and tangent. Most computer programs will perform a variety of somewhat separate tasks in order to accomplish an overall task. An example of this is the analysis of a set of data. In order to analyze the data, you'll first need to import the data into Octave, perform some calculations, and probably plot the results. Each of these tasks can require multiple operations. Performing multiple tasks like these cause the programs to become longer and more complicated, which makes them harder to use and debug. Program modules are loosely defined as a set of code that performs some specific task, such as creating a plot or importing data. These modules can be developed and debugged independently and then combined relatively easily into an overall program. The easiest way to create these modules are as functions. User-defined functions operate the same way as Octave's built-in functions, and they're created similarly to script files. So before talking about user-defined functions, I'll review built-in functions in the context of Octave's cart to pull command. All functions have to have a name. This function's name is cart to pull. Functions accept a list of input arguments, which are placed in a comma-separated variable list in parentheses after the function name. The input arguments provide the information that the function needs to do its job. The function doesn't know any other information rather than what you list here. Also, the function doesn't know or care what variable names you use in the input argument list. You can call these variables A and B, X and Y, or Joe and Bob. The function accepts a list of output arguments in square brackets. These are the only variables that the function returns to you. It doesn't add any variables to your workspace other than these. Again, the function doesn't care what the names are. They can be named theta and rho, radius and angle, or any other two valid variable names. There are a few things that you need to really keep in mind when using functions. They may seem natural, but they're common sources of confusion when people start creating their own functions. First, the only information exchanged between you and the function are the variables listed as input and output variables. If the function creates any other variables in the process of calculating the output variables, it won't provide them back to you. The function doesn't rely on you to provide the arguments as specific variable names. Typically, the function uses different variable names than the ones you assign in the input and ar output argument list. The function assigns its variables based on the order in which they appear in these lists, rather than the actual variable names. Now I'll talk about how the operation of the functions is different from script files, which you're probably pretty familiar with by now. To start with, functions each have their own workspace. Script files, however, use the base workspace. The base workspace is the workspace that you're using when you execute commands at the command window. That's why all the variables created in your script files automatically appear in the workspace, and any variables you put in the workspace are available for your script file to use. Since the function doesn't have access to the base workspace, you have to provide it with the numbers it needs by listing the numbers as input arguments. Likewise, the only information you get back from the function are the variables in the output argument list. The great part about this is that no other variables created by the function will accidentally overwrite any variables that are already in your workspace. Creating a function is pretty much the same as creating a script file. You still use Octave's editor. The only real difference between a function and a script file is that the first executable command in a function must be a function declaration statement. The function declaration statement identifies the file as a function and lists the input and output arguments that the function will use. Part of declaring a function is providing the function a name. 
the function declaration statement has to start with the word function. After the word function, the output arguments are listed within square brackets, separated by commas. If there is only one output argument, the square brackets are optional. After the list of output arguments, there's an assignment operator. Next is the name of the function. You get to decide what that name is. Rules about appropriate function names correspond to rules for naming variables. It should start with a letter, have no spaces, and no special characters other than underscores. After the function name, the input arguments are listed within parentheses. The variables in this list are separated by commas. After this function declaration statement, type the commands you want the function to execute exactly as if you were creating a script file. After you create this function, you'll save it just as you would a script file. It's good programming practice to make the file name you save this in the same as the name defined in the function declaration statement. If you do name the file differently from the name in the function declaration, execute the function by using the file name rather than the name in the declaration statement. Now I'll do a quick demo of the creation of a function file. There are a variety of ways to create a function file. All of these are pretty much identical to creation of script files, except that the function file has a function declaration statement. I'll just create function files the same way that I create script files and type my function declaration statement myself. I'm going to create a file by using the edit command at the command prompt. I'll type edit function underscore demo and press enter. The file gets created in the current folder and the usual blank editor window opens. The first thing I need to do is create a function declaration statement. The first word of any function file will be function. My function is only intended to demonstrate how functions work, so I'll just create some random input arguments. Input arguments are contained in square brackets, so type an open square bracket and a couple of variable names, var underscore one and output two, then close the square brackets. Next, type an assignment operator. The function name goes after the assignment operator. It's a good idea to make the function name and the name of the file the same. So I'll name my function function underscore demo. If you do happen to make the function name different than the file name, use the file name when you execute the function. Then, inside parentheses, list your input arguments. I'll have two inputs, in underscore one and in arg two and close the parentheses. From here on, just type the commands you want your function to execute. Of course, you'll probably want some comments, so for this demonstration I'll add a useless one. So percent, this is a function that does some stuff. Next I'll do some random mathematical operations. I'll create a variable named myVar, which is two times in underscore one plus three. Now I'll define one of my output arguments, var underscore one, as the product of my var and in arg two. Var underscore one equals my var dot asterisk in arg two. Finally, I'll create the output argument, output two, as two times my var plus in arg two. That's all I'll have the function do but I do want to comment on a few things. First, the function doesn't need to know anything except the values for the input arguments, in underscore one and in arg two, and the values of the usual predefined variables like pi, i, and j. Those are defined in any workspace that gets created, including the functions. Second, I need to define all of the arguments in my output argument list. If I try to return an undefined variable, Octave will complain. I followed all of my commands with semicolons, so the function itself doesn't display anything in the command window. Finally, the variable myVar gets created by the function, and it's used in a calculation inside the function, but it's not 
in the output argument list, so it won't be defined in the command windows workspace. To make the function available to be executed, I just click on save. But before I actually run the file, I'll make a few comments about executing function files. User-defined functions are used exactly the way Octave's built-in functions are used. All input arguments have to be defined before the function is executed. Your function must define all of its output variables before it can terminate. If your function tries to return an unassigned variable, you'll get an error. As with script files, Octave needs to be able to find your function in order to execute it. My usual recommendation is to place the functions you'll be using during a given session in the current working folder. Octave will always look there for functions and files. I'll execute my function from the command window. I can execute the function exactly as I would any Octave built-in function. I need to send some values to the functions, so I'll do I need to send some values to the function, so I'll define variables a and b as a equals 3 and b equals 2. Now I'll send these values to the function and return the variables as out1 and out2. So open square bracket, out1, comma, out2, close square bracket, equals function underscore demo, open parentheses, a comma b, close parentheses. Notice that none of my argument names correspond to names in the function. The values are not assigned by name. They're simply assigned according to their order in the argument lists. So the value in a will get assigned to n underscore 1, since they are both the first variable in the input argument list and the value of b will get assigned to in arg2 in the function. So inside the function in underscore 1 is 3 and in arg2 is 2. My var is 2 times 3 plus 3 which is 9. var underscore 1 is then 9 times in arg2 or 9 times 2 or 18. So the, first arg out so the first output argument is 18. Finally, output 2 is 2 times 9 plus 2, which is 20. So the second output argument is 20. At this point, Octave's gotten to the end of the file, so the file stops executing, returns the output arguments, and closes its workspace. When I called the function, the first output argument was named out underscore 1, which should be 18, and the second output argument is named out underscore 2, which should get assigned the value of 20. I'll run the function by pressing enter and see if that's what actually happens. Cool. The function works as it was supposed to. Now I'll check the contents of the base workspace by typing WHO. The base workspace has only values for a, b, out1, and out2. The variables created by the function, in underscore 1, in arg2, my var, var underscore 1, and output2, were in the functions workspace and are not available for me now. Now we'll talk a little bit about the difference between the function name and the name of the file containing the function. I'll rename the file by right-clicking on the file name in the current folder window, selecting rename, and changing the name to function underscore demo2. Now if I try to run the function by typing my old command, I get an error. However, I can run the function underscore demo2 file by using its file name in the command. Press up arrow, change the command, and it works, even though the file and the function names don't agree. This is bad programming practice, so I'm going to change the file name back to its original name. 
Notice that I followed all of my commands in the function with semicolons, so the function itself isn't displaying anything. The displayed values are the result of executing the function. I'll delete the semicolons after the creation of the myvar and var underscore one variables, save the file, and rerun it. The function runs and displays the values for myvar and var underscore one. Then the function terminates, sends the output arguments to the workspace that are assigned to the out1 and out2 variables. Since I didn't follow the function execution command with a semicolon, these values are displayed. If I don't want to see these values, I can just follow the command executing the function with a semicolon. Now only the function displays values. Finally, I want to mention a few topics that are useful to know but are probably not crucial for creation and use of most functions. If you decide to execute a script file within a function, the script file will use the functions workspace, not the base workspace. The function stops executing when one of two conditions are satisfied, when the end of the file is reached or when a return command is encountered. This will become more important when we start writing programs that make decisions and perform different actions based on those decisions. Also, Octave's text editor may suggest that you end your function with an end statement, which is simply the word end. This is probably good programming practice, but it's not necessary. There are a couple of variables that get defined in the function's workspace whenever a function is called. They're called nargin and nargout, and they contain the number of input and output arguments. You can set up your function to do different things based on the number of arguments. That's why a lot of built-in octave functions can have alternate uses based on the number of arguments. You can define variables that will be available in all workspaces so that they're available to your functions without sending them to the function as arguments. You do this with the global command and the resulting variables are called global variables. Be careful if you do this. A global value redefines the variable value everywhere. This essentially eliminates one of the best features of functions, the isolation of various workspaces from one another. That's about all there is to functions. While it seems like a bit more work to have to define input and output arguments, the effort more than pays off in the long run. Your programs can become more modular and you don't have to work as hard to make sure you aren't accidentally overwriting an existing variable. It also becomes much easier to do tasks that are repetitive or commonly done. This advantage will become more obvious when I talk about decision making and looping structures.